Greetings and welcome back to 303. We are in junior English and we now turn in your hymnals to 756757 and beyond. And we will turn now to the great American novelist John Steinbeck. And a cutting from his most important novel, Grapes of Wrath. Now, let's say this out loud. The challenge for us, of course, is, uh, is to understand how these textbooks are compiled. That is to say, anthologies. What is an anthology? Well, it's kind of a collection of different kinds of writers and different kinds of stuff they've written. Let me just try and help you get into the mindset of this challenge. Imagine for a moment if of all the songs on your playlist, I'm going to guess it's more than a thousand and uh, whatever device it is you have, what if I were to ask you that you have to choose only five authors or artists or bands, only five, to represent your musical palette, what you like, only five. Some of you would report that that would be tantamount to torture of a kind. You'd be like, yeah, there ain't no way that I can reduce all of the artists down to just five. Wait, I'm not done. What if I were to say, of those five artists that you finally decided, all right, fine, 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 I've made my list of those five artists or bands that are most important to me, I were to say to you, you can only choose one song of the five to represent. See, and some of you already are going, yeah, now, if the first selection would be pretty much impossible, the second selection is like impossible. How am I going to tell you, you might say, Mr. McGee, how am I going to tell you about my favorite five bands by selecting one of their songs? But what if I were to come back to you and say, the song that you selected for each of your five is too long. You can only select two minutes from the song. That's all. Do you got me? You would admit this would now be like, well, first of all, you are ruining whatever it is that you're asking me to say. You're totally ruining that experience. This is exactly what happens when we have to make an anthology. Let's call it, I don't know, for kicks and giggles, an anthology of American literature. American literature. We're talking about tens of thousands of writers and hundreds of thousands of titles that all those cats wrote. Your textbook company has this impossible task of saying, out of all of the writers, we will only select a small handful. From that small handful, we will only select, to use my metaphor, one song. And a lot of times, the one song we select, it's only going to be part of the song. Again, you would probably argue, well, we're not getting a real good cross-section of, of writers, are we? No, of course not. The academic way to say this is the limiting effect of anthologies. Let me give you a classic example. If you're going to talk about American authors, you have to talk about a guy named John Steinbeck. If you're going to talk about John Steinbeck, you have to talk about his most influential novel, Grapes of Wrath. I would write that title down right away as a significant title in the history of American thought. But here's the problem for your anthology. Grapes of Wrath is a 300-page novel. You can't put a 300-page novel in an anthology. So, what is it that your textbook company does? Well, they jump into the novel Grapes of Wrath and they select out just a few lines. They call it The Turtle and now we're going to be able to say that we've read something of John Steinbeck. Of course, the problem with this approach is that you completely miss so much of the importance of John Steinbeck, right? Let's go now to page 756 at least and kind of get a sense of how they're going to set us up to this. Under a literary analysis topic, and again, I hope you're putting this at level 2B, let's read for just a second. An allegory, I would definitely write that word down on 756. An allegory is a narrative in which every literal element has a symbolic meaning. An allegory does not simply contain symbols, but is a symbol in and of itself. For example, this story is the third chapter of John Steinbeck's novel, The Grapes of Wrath. The novel, Grapes of Wrath, tells the story of the Joads, I would write that name down, 
a family of farm workers struggling to survive the devastating drought in Oklahoma during the Great Depression. Every element in Steinbeck's description of the title and the landscape through which it struggles can be related to the Jodes and their struggles. The allegory of the turtle helps Steinbeck express the novel's theme, the message, or comment on life. Novelists rarely state their themes directly. Instead, they reveal themes indirectly through these means. One, character statements, beliefs, actions. Two, events in the plot. Three, the use of literary devices such as description and symbol. As you read, consider the deeper meanings of the events in the story. Of course, your reading strategy is to an analyze patterns of symbolism and notice your vocabulary words there are four. Let's jump across the effacing page really quickly to just a few seconds to kind of see the dates of John Steinbeck and one or two things about his biography. Notice the dates, 1902 to 1968, okay? Let's read. I'm on page 757. No writer portrays more vividly than John Steinbeck what it was like to live through the Great Depression of the 1930s. His stories and novels capture the poverty, desperation, social injustice experienced by many working class Americans during this bleak period. Of course, let's pause for a moment and just put it in your notes. Some of you know because in your sophomore year you had to read Steinbeck's classic little, really it's a novella, Of Mice and Men. Right? And so you know a little bit about Steinbeck because of that story, right? And the tragic ending. Maybe some of you not so much reading but watching a film of the same title. Let's keep working. As in the works of naturalist writers like Stephen Crane and Jack London, Steinbeck's characters struggle desperately against forces beyond their understanding and control. While many of his characters suffer tragic fates, they almost always exhibit bravery and dignity in their struggles. Modest beginnings, next heading. Steinbeck was born in Salinas, California. By his late teens, he was supporting himself by working as a laborer. After high school, he enrolled at Stanford University. He left before graduating, however, and spent the next five years drifting across the country, working in a variety of odd jobs, including fish hatcher, fruit picker, laboratory assistant, surveyor, apprentice painter, and journalist. I would just pause for a moment and have you put this in your notes. One of the things that makes Steinbeck interesting is that he left school, he dropped out of college, and he went and he did real work. Some of us will call it real work. That is to say, he did stuff that's hard labor. And while he was doing that hard labor, of course, guess what? He was not living a solitary existence, was he? He was with other people. He was learning about what it means to be a normal American, a normal human being. So when he sits down finally to write his fiction, all of those experiences are going to inform the way he writes. The next heading, First Success. Steinbeck's first three books received little or negative attention from critics. This changed in 1935 when he published Tortilla Flat. The book received the California Commonwealth Goals Club Medal for Best Novel by a California Author. Two years later, the author earned even greater recognition and acclaim with, we've mentioned the title already, Of Mice and Men, 1937. The novel became a bestseller and was made into a Broadway play and a movie, right? Of course, the great novel is what we'll say next in the heading. Steinbeck went on to write what is generally regarded as his finest novel, The Grapes of Wrath. Let's put the date down, 1939. It's the story of the Jode family. Oklahoma farmers dispossessed of their land and forced to become migrant workers in California. The novel won the National Book Award and the Pulitzer Prize and aroused public sympathy for the flight of farm workers. Steinbeck produced several more successful novels, including his later years, and in 1962 received the Nobel Prize for Literature. In accepting that award, he noted his belief that literature can sustain people through hard times. He asked that it is he added that it is the writer's responsibility to celebrate the human, quote, capacity for greatness of heart and spirit, for gallantry and defeat, and for courage, compassion, and love, end quote. One of the things your textbook company is trying to help you as well experience here, and if you'll turn really quickly to 776, 77, uh, 7, I'm sorry, 766 to 767, if you'll look on those two pages real quickly, 
you'll get a sense of how your textbook company is trying to help you understand a little bit of the time period called the Depression, yes? And here are some famous images, black and white pictures, that kind of demonstrate a little of that time period. Grapes of Wrath is the great American novel that tells the story of a group of people, a family, the Jode family, who are trying to find some way to survive during the Depression. They uh, work on the land in Oklahoma, but they don't own the land. And when the bank comes in and forecloses on their land, then they have to leave their, their house that they've lived in. Well, they don't want to leave their house. Yeah, a big tractor comes along and just drives its blade right through the middle of their house. It's over. It's done. Well, what are they supposed to do and where are they supposed to go? Well, this is a time when there's not a lot of help from the government. And so all they can do is get in a busted up old vehicle and head west. From Oklahoma, they travel to California. Why are they going to California? They hope that they can find work, especially picking work from the fruit trees. Because California, they grow lots of fruit. There's all kinds of promises that there will be jobs. But when the Jodes get there, they are stunned to find out that tens of thousands of other families have made the same exodus out of the Midwest, the Dust Bowl as it's referred to, to California. When they get there, the deprivation, the starvation, the camps that are built up, unbelievable. And they have to try to survive. So Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath is a novel that basically draws a really bleak picture of how terrible an experience it is. The third chapter of that novel is the one that they have included in your book, 758, 759. It's called The Turtle. And what we'll do now is we'll just read this and we'll make some observations about the ways in which Steinbeck is playing kind of an allegory game, a symbolic game here, by telling us about this little turtle okay, in this chapter. This is interesting for Steinbeck because this doesn't really have anything to do with the novel and with the traveling of the Jode family to the West. I'll begin on page 758. Read with me. Background. The Great Depression of the 1930s was a time of profound economic distress. In 1932, one quarter of all Americans were out of work. One of many factors contributing to the Depression was a drought in Oklahoma. The drought was so severe that farmland literally blew away in massive dust storms. This is the situation faced by the Jode family, whose story Steinbeck tells in his novel, The Grapes of Wrath. This tale of the turtle is the third chapter of that epic book. And obviously, one of, the one, one of the invitations we will make in reading something like this is some of you will like this so much that you'll say, I wonder what the rest of the novel is like, and maybe decide at some point in your life to pick it up and read. Let's read together, shall we? And again, just to challenge you, while we read, try to follow along with the words. The tip of your pen or pencil is a great kind of exercise to keep you engaged so that you just don't listen to my reading of this, but rather try to read it for yourself. If you are at all interested in ACT prep, let me remind you, the ACT is a three-hour reading test. The number one way you can get ready for that three-hour reading test is what? To read. So as we work together, try and actually read along with me here and see how focused you can be, all right? The turtle. The concrete highway was edged with a mat of tangled, broken, dry grass. And the grass heads were heavy with oak beards to catch on a dog's coat and fox tails to tangle in a, in a horse's fetlocks and clover burrs to fasten in sheep's wool, sleeping life waiting to be spread and dispersed, every seed armed with an appliance of dispersal, twisting darts and parachutes for the wind, little spears and balls of tiny thorns, and all waiting for animals and for the wind, for a man's trouser cuff or the hem of a woman's skirt, all passive but armed with appliances of activity, still but each possessed of the analog of movement. Now, let's pause for just a moment and point out that the way Steinbeck opens this chapter is by talking about the stuff that grows along the road. I once had a student that said, you know, it's funny, the other day we broke down. 
next on the highway. Our vehicle broke down. And I was standing next to the highway. I don't know if you've ever had this experience as a 3B observation personal. Have you ever had the experience of standing there and the cars come flying by at, at 70 miles an hour and you're all kind of there all by yourself and you start looking around, you obviously see things you normally would not see when you're sitting in your vehicle driving at 70 miles an hour, right? Some students have pointed out that if you break down out here between, for example, Worland and Tensley, one of the first things that comes to mind is how unbelievable unbelievably lonely it is. It is literally the middle of nowhere. And then there's this weird thing about silence. It's a really weird kind of silence with just the wind blowing. But if you pay attention to what grows along the side of the road, here, notice the observation is for Steinbeck, all kinds of stuff growing along the side of the road that ultimately is going to attach itself to something else, an animal, a cuff, and it's going to be taken somewhere and it's going to be grown somewhere else. Most of that stuff, of course, sticker burrows and things like that. In other words, life forms that most people don't really like. Let's keep reading. I'm on page 759. The sun lay on the grass and warmed it. And in the shade under the grass, the insects moved. Ants and ant lions to set traps for them. Grasshoppers to jump into the air and flick their yellow wings for a second. Sow bugs were like armadillos plodding restlessly on many tender feet. And over the grass on the roadside, a land turtle crawled, turning aside for nothing, dragging his high dome shell over the grass. Now we're going to pause here just in your notes at level one and put this. From going, from Sunday, from the perspective of talking about just what grows along the side of the road, all of a sudden he shifts his attention and he says, oh yeah, there's life form there too. All different kinds of life form, ants and everything else. But then his focus will shift to a turtle, all right? And now we're going to have the description of this turtle. And again, right down at level 2B, notice how this turtle becomes symbolic, a symbol of something, representing something. Let's hear about this turtle, okay? His hard legs and yellow nailed feet threshed slowly through the grass, not really walking, but boosting and dragging his shell along. The barley beads slid off his shell, and the clover burrs fell on him and rolled to the ground. His horny beak was partly opened, and his fierce, humorous eyes, under brows like fingernails, stared straight ahead. He came over the grass, leaving a beaten trail behind him, and the hill, which was the highway embankment, reared up ahead of him. For a moment he stopped, his head held high. He blinked and looked up and down. At last, he started to climb the embankment. Now let's just pause for a moment and point out, one of the things that makes Steinbeck such a remarkable writer is his eye, we might say, for detail. In the same way that our images poets that we were studying before are going to capture almost like a photograph, like a, with your phone, like a snapshot or something, you're going to get the same game being played here for Steinbeck with prose. He's going to now describe something about this turtle trying to get up this embankment. Of course, what's ironic about the hard work of getting up the embankment? What's on the other side of the embankment once he gets up there? Right, the road. And what's on the road? Right, a big vehicle that could crush the turtle, right? Let's see how the turtle works. Front clawed feet reached forward but did not touch. The hind feet kicked his shell along and it scraped on the grass and on the gravel. As the embankment grew steeper and steeper, the more frantic were the efforts of the land turtle, pushing hind legs, strained and slipped, boosting the shell along, and the horny head protruded as far as the neck could stretch, Little by little, the shell slid up the embankment until at last the parapet cut straight across its line of march, the shoulder of the road, a concrete wall five inches high. So in other words, you got the, you got the curb, right? So he finally gets up there. Now he's got a curb he's got to get over. As though they worked independently, the hind legs pushed the shell against the wall. The head upraised and peered over the wall to the broad, smooth plain of semen. 
Now the hands, braced on top of the wall, strained and lifted, and the shell came slowly up and rested its front end on the wall. For a moment, the turtle rested. A red ant ran into the shell, and the soft skin inside the shell, and suddenly head and legs snapped in, and the armored tail clammed in sideways. The red ant was crushed between body and legs, and one head of wild oats was clammed into the shell by a front leg. For a long moment, the turtle lay still, and then the neck crept out, and the old humorous frowning eyes looked about, and the legs and tail came out. The back legs went to work, straining like elephant legs, and the shell tipped to an angle so that the front legs could not reach the level cement plane. But higher and higher, the hind legs boosted it, until at last the center of balance was reached, the front tipped down, the front legs stretched at the pavement, and it was up. But the head of wild oats was held by its stem around the front legs. Now the going was easy, and all the legs worked, and the shell boosted along, waggling from side to side. A sedan driven by a 40-year-old woman approached. She saw the turtle and swung to the right off the highway. The wheels screamed and a cloud of dust boiled up. Two wheels lifted for a moment and then settled. The car skidded back onto the road and went on, but more slowly. The turtle had jerked into its shell, but now it hurried on, for the highway was burning hot. And now a light truck approached, and as it came near, the driver saw the turtle and swerved to hit it. His front wheel struck the edge of the shell, flipped the turtle like a tiddlywink, spun it like a coin, and rolled it off the highway. The truck went back to its course along the right side. Lying on its back, the turtle was tight in its shell for a long time, but at last its legs waved in the air, reaching for something to pull it over. Its front foot caught a piece of quartz, and a little by little the shell pulled over and flopped upright. The wild oat head fell out, and the three of the spearhead seeds stuck to the ground. And as the turtle crawled on down the embankment, its shell dragged dirt over the seeds. The turtle entered a dust road and jerked itself along, drawing a wavy, shallow trench in the dust with its shell. The old, humorous eyes looked ahead, and the horny beak opened a little. His yellow toenails slipped a fraction. 